Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Reading, Writing, and Brow. I'm glad to be back. We are almost in July. Hard to believe that next week it is the 4th of July, but the days just keep on coming, as do these episodes. So tonight, I am excited because Ralph is welcoming Kevin Schindler and Brian Anderson, who wrote The Lincoln Memorial. And this book, you know, walks us through pretty much what it sounds like, the Lincoln Memorial and then more. So we're going to get to see a lot of these, you know, national iconic landmarks. You're probably going to learn a lot more about them than you thought you already knew. Um, yeah, I think it's going to be a great show. We have a lot of photos to go through. I'm going to welcome Ralph so he can give us a little bit more detail before we start things. Hi, Ralph. How's it going? Hey, Grace. How are you doing today? I am good. I am good. So tell us a little bit more about our authors tonight. Yes, uh, Brian um, Anderson and Kevin Schindler um, put together a, uh, a book which takes us on a, a photographic journey um, uh, telling the story of uh, the Lincoln Memorial start to finish, um, you know, some of the history in and around uh, Lincoln. Um, and even up to current times through this wonderful illustrative journey. And they do a great job telling the story through these images. It's just wonderful. And um, so I'm excited to have them on. It's um, always good when, when um, you can see the work evolve through the pictures and uh, they've got some wonderful photographs to share with us tonight. So we'll give viewers an insight um into not only the the book that they put together and wrote and also the lincoln memorial itself so yeah i've gotten to see some of those photos already i'm excited to share them with everyone i am going to take off and i will let you guys handle it from here hi brian hi kevin how are you guys doing hi ralph great Whoa. great for you and you and Grace to have us on tonight. Thanks. Yeah, you guys are um, wonderful to be on as guests. We we love authors. We love folks that are enthusiastic about their work and uh, and passionate about uh, um, um, their accomplishments. So, uh, what I always like to do is ask the the the, the uh, authors to give a little bit of a background about themselves. And in your case, you, you can each talk about your background, what you've done, and also how you came together on your collaboration. So why don't we start with you, uh, uh, Brian, and, and tell everybody your background, where you live. And um... Well, I am uh, from California, originally born, raised, educated through uh, law school. And uh, when I graduated from law school on the West Coast, Having never lived on the East Coast, but always been interested in the East Coast, I sought and obtained a job as a law clerk to a federal judge here in Washington, D.C. for a term of one year. And the plan was to go back to San Francisco after that job was finished. But like so many people who come to Washington intending to stay here for a short time and go back home, I never went home, and uh, I have been a Washingtonian for 36 years. I, uh, after my clerkship, I spent a couple of years working in the federal government, and then uh, in the late 1980s, I joined a, uh, an international law firm, uh, spent 30 years defending class action lawsuits all over the country, and, um, and retired in 2012. Um, along that time, uh, I became a trustee of the Ford's Theater Society, which is the nonprofit organization that presents theatrical and educational programming at the National Park Service Historic Site. And through that, and just general curiosity, I came to learn more about Abraham Lincoln and the Civil War and the issues related to his uh, presidency. And uh, so when I, I, I retired, I wrote a book about the uh, Ford's Theater, and uh, Kevin will tell the rest of the story, but that kind of led to the book that we're talking about tonight. Great, great. And uh, uh, Kevin, how about yourself? Uh, let's hear about your background. And Well, I'm an Ohio boy. I grew up in a little town called Valley City, not far outside of Cleveland, and I always liked old things, I, starting with fossils that I used to collect in the backyard. So I 
I went to a small school in Ohio named Marietta College because that's where my favorite teacher, Mr. Leggett, went. Um, and after that, I moved. To, I my route to Arizona, where I live now, was kind of circuitous. I moved to um, Florida and worked at a natural history museum in Gainesville for several years, and then ended up here in Flagstaff, Arizona. And I've been working here at Loeb Observatory for 27 years now. So I started out looking at the ground as fossils. Now I look up at the stars. Um, but <laughs> through that time, I've also been, always been interested, like I said, in history. So um, I've been involved in a lot of local history organizations, um, local and regional. And, um, and through my time at Lowell, wrote several books about the observatory just to because there really wasn't much out there and to give our visitors here something, you know, to take home a memory of, of their visit here. And so, wow. um, so I've been here for a while, but I, I always, gosh, one of my favorite monuments is the Lincoln Memorial. And I first saw it when I was in college, I was on the rowing team at Marietta college and we, we had a event against Georgetown. And so, we rode down the Potomac and the day before the race, I think we went further than we were supposed to past the boathouse, but we kept going. And that was my first view of the Lincoln Memorial. And it, it was inspiring. And um, it would be, gosh, a couple of decades before I was able to actually see it. Um, but but eventually I could not only see it, but but you know, this book came out of it. Yeah, I remember, I think most people will remember the first time they saw the Lincoln Memorial. I was an adult the first time. And uh, uh, much like Brian, I, I, I relocated from New York City uh, to Washington and never left. And I remember seeing the, the Lincoln Memorial for the first time and it was just um, overwhelming. Uh, let me ask you a question though. You're out there in, at, um, in Flagstaff, Arizona and you're on the observatory. Are the people out there as fascinated with the alignment of the planets as they are here? <laughs> well, I don't know if I'd say as much or maybe even more so because um, Northern Arizona is a mecca for astronomy. Um, where I work at Lowell Observatory, it was founded 18 years before Arizona was even a state. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, Pluto was discovered here, the first evidence of the expanding universe, and there are other astronomy organizations in town. So, and, and Flagstaff is also the world's first international dark sky city, meaning we have regulations keeping the skies dark. And so there's a real connection um, with the universe. And yeah, the alignment of the planets is really cool. <laughs> yeah, we see it here. It is really cool. So, um, so how did you guys come to collaborate, not only on um, this project, but other projects in your past? If you I think you've collaborated on some in the past. So talk well, about is, that a little bit. This is actually our first collaboration. Okay. Um, and I, I had done several books with Arcadia um, down in South Carolina, um, these books about Lowell Observatory. And some, I don't know, a couple of years, 2018 or 19, I can't remember, um, I was talking to one of my editors there, and I had, I had realized that the centennial for the dedication of Lincoln Memorial was 2022. And I just brought this up and I said, I, you know, I even, what's the book, you know, you guys must have done a book about Lincoln Memorial and with the centennial coming up, it's a natural. And she said, you know, we don't have one. I'm not sure why, but the Lincoln Memorial is the most visited or one of the most visited um, places in Washington. We sure as heck should have one. Would you like to do it? Uh, and I said, well, you know, so outside of astronomy and local history, but I've always had a fascination and I'm pretty familiar with Lincoln. And, and so they said, okay, we'd like you to do this, but we'd also like you to have somebody that lives in DC because this is a press that focuses on local stories and having somebody in DC makes sense. And so um, I looked at, at, I thought, okay, who'd be a good author? I looked at Arcadia's um, list of publications and there was this one about Forest Theater. I thought, my gosh, how perfect is that? There's somebody who's an expert on Abraham Lincoln and Forest Theater and his name was Brian Anderson. <laughs> and so I can't remember how I stalked him and tracked down contact information, um, but I was able to. And he, um, I, I don't know, in a moment of not making a good decision, he answered the phone, I think, <laughs> and we ended up talking. 
and, and that that was kind of the formation of it. And it's it's been a really great journey since then. Now, how did you how did you come up with the concept to do it in a pictorial fashion? Well, if we can have the next slide, um, you know, when we were thinking about the Lincoln Memorial, talking about a project, you know, there have been a lot of books, certainly a, a gazillion books about Abraham Lincoln and a gazillion minus one books about the Lincoln Memorial. But but many of them are, you know, tour guide books or things that you would pick up in the gift shop that are, you know, brief stories. Um, there are, I think, the three best um comprehensive books um there are the three shown in the bottom here um and they all they have pictures but they don't you know the lincoln memorial is such a great photographic story and none of the all of these um have some pictures but none you know like a, a picture book per se and in arcadia you know they've made they have a cottage industry in these images of america um, where you have you know a couple hundred images telling the story with those and captions and it just it just made sense. It was a niche that nobody had filled before. So between that and the centennial coming up, it seemed like um, kind of an ideal way of doing it. Yeah, it's it, it's it's terrific the way that it's been done. Um, what I want to do now is <clears throat> remind the audience about the trivia um, uh, questions. So tonight we'll have two trivia questions. Remember the first one to type in the comments section with the correct answer wins. You can look it up on your phones. You can, if you need to, you can use Google. So let's start with the first question. So again, first person to type in the comment section, the correct answer. So the question is how are Alaska and Hawaii honored at the Lincoln Memorial? Um, all the other states are wrapped around the facade with their names and their states that they, and the dates they were entered into statehood. Um, Alaska and Hawaii are not. So how are they honored? So uh, let's talk about Lincoln for a second. Um, I don't know which one of you want to field the question, but tell the audience something about Lincoln that is not widely or commonly known or taught in the history books. Well, so Alf, I'll take this one on because given my work with Ford Theater, having written a Ford Theater book and now working with Kevin on this book, I've I wouldn't say I'm a Lincoln scholar by any means, but I sure have read a lot of things about him. And there are a lot of quasi obscure facts about him that frankly, most people probably already know. But one that struck me was that after becoming a lawyer in Illinois and serving several terms in the Illinois state legislature, uh, Lincoln uh, ran for the House of Representatives and was elected and served beginning in 1847. But he decided before he even won that election that he would only serve one two-year term. There were other Whig, then he was then a Whig, remember the Whig party. There were other local Whig politicians in his area of Illinois who he was friends with, and he essentially made a deal with the other Whig politicians. Look, let me run for the House now. I will serve one term, step aside, then one of you can run for that position, and then the other of you can run for that position. And that strikes me, apropos of my own story and the record of so many politicians who come to, to Washington promising to serve only a short time and go back home. He actually honored that <laughs> that commitment, but uh, and, and 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 coincidentally, however, during that one term that he served in 1848 as a member of Congress, he was uh, in attendance in person at the laying of the cornerstone of the Washington Monument. Oh wow! Wow, interesting. So what was his rationale for the one term? He, he, he didn't see himself being as a long-term congressman or? Well, he, he, A, I think he generally wanted to give other local politicians the opportunity to serve in Congress. Also, he was, he was married and had children and had a law practice and a family to support. And so I think he was eager to get back to Illinois and resume his uh, law practice. 
So, interesting. So that's a good tidbit to, to know about him. So um, something else when I was um, uh, going through your, your work that struck me that I didn't realize was there was such a thing called the Macmillan Commission that was responsible, I guess, for planning and design of the mall and the surrounding areas. So tell the viewers a little bit about the Macmillan Commission and, and what it meant not only to the, for the Lincoln Memorial, but for the landscape um, in, the, in the DC area. Sure, so the, the Macmillan Commission was formed uh, just before 1800, when we were about to recognize the centennial of the founding of the District of Columbia. Um, the, uh, the, the war had been won, the country was growing economically, it was becoming a powerhouse on the world stage. Frankly, it was an era of nationalism, uh, celebrating all that the country had accomplished since the reunification of the country after the Civil War. It was also a time in Washington, D.C. and around other major cities in the United States of civic improvement. You know, improve the sewer system, improve street lighting, pave the streets, create parks and, and monuments. And so the Macmillan Commission decided to complete Pierre L'Enfant's vision of creating a grand avenue from the capital out to the shores of the Potomac River and fill in that area with monuments to the nation's heroes. The Washington Monument was already under construction and in fact had been completed by then, uh, but to include a monument to Lincoln and also create space for monuments to uh, others such as Thomas Jefferson and create parks and trees and paths and, and roads. And so that is, is what happened in the first decade of the 20th century. The development of the Lincoln Memorial was very much a part of that strategy. And it was collectively designed to celebrate reunification of the country by among other things, creating this straight line from the Capitol to the Washington Monument honoring the father of the country to the Lincoln Memorial honoring the savior uh, of the Union. And so it was all part of this of this plan. Wow. So and that kind of uh, segues into my next question. Um, the Let's talk about the Lincoln Memorial itself and the history of the design and and how it evolved. And so, who wants to take that one? I can I can jump in here. Go ahead. Um, so, you know, it's a it's an interesting thing. There are two stories here. There's the development of Washington and the plan that Brian mentioned, um, designed by Lafont Lafont, um, in the late 1700s, and then a century later, the Macmillan Commission coming along and using that as a basis for this plan of really developing. And then there's, there's of course, that there's Lincoln, and he, he was assassinated in 1865. I mean, within two years, there was an effort to memorialize him in some way. And if I could have the mill slide, Grace. Um, and so right away, there was this idea of celebrating Lincoln, but it, it's interesting because I think one of the fascinating things about the memorial is if it had been built in that first effort in 1867, it would be completely different than what it is now. It would look it would look probably something like this, because in 1867, Congress created a commission to look at some sort of memorial, and the idea was to celebrate Lincoln as the emancipator, and so they hired an architect named Mills to design this thing. And this is, this is what the design would look like with several levels of, of important individuals that, that tied into the emancipation story. Well, this never came to be. Um, fundraising didn't do much. Um, and the politics, you know, is just after, you know, we're, the Civil War is just ending. There's reconstruction. There's changing um, political power. And so over the next several decades, 
there were several attempts to try to create, you know, some sort of memorial. Commissions would be created by Congress. Um, bills would be introduced by both representatives and and um, Cong and uh, senators, and it would get to nothing. Um, nothing much happened with it. But then we got um, to the to the early 1900s, and and it turned into more of a kind of a serious effort. Um, and as Brian mentioned. Um, the idea now was, I mean, there are different ideas floating around. Maybe we have a memorial somewhere in D.C. Maybe we build a, a road from Washington, D.C. to Gettysburg with statues and stuff along the way that celebrates um, Lincoln, which, again, would be probably focusing more on um, emancipation. Well, as, as Brian mentioned, you know, the United States in the early 20th century under the leadership of Theodore Roosevelt and others was becoming a world power. And I think partly tied into that, um, this uh, a commission finally was formed that came up with a solid plan, but it was no longer to focus on Lincoln as the emancipator, but to, but to Lincoln as the man who reunified the country. And, and we'll talk later on about elements within the memorial that really um, reinforce this idea of reunification. And so, you know, 1867, the plan was to celebrate Lincoln, the man, as the emancipator. By the, by the time the final design was being made, it was more of Lincoln as this demigod um, and, and focus more on him as reunifying the country. And, and he had grown to such a stature, you know, who knows if he had not been assassinated, would he, be, would he have grown as he has, I mean, this mythical figure almost. And so it's, it's interesting how the, the development of, um, of the memorial changed over time. If we can have the Bacon slide, um, we had an architect um, named Bacon, who um, he was asked to, to come up with some, some drawings. And this is his first or one of his first drawings of the of a memorial. Um, and it, he made several of them, kept revising them, they all included some sort of waterway and some sort of Greek looking temple. And in fact, based on the Parthenon design. And again, you think, um, you know, Lincoln, humble, small town, and then he's enshrined in this Greek temple. It doesn't, it doesn't quite fit. It doesn't seem like, but it's again, represents, you know, where the United States turning into a world power and Lincoln turning into this demigod. And so, this, so several plans, um, Bacon des designed several different, different uh, modifications, but then there was another, um, another um, architect that was asked to, to um, put in some designs. We can have the next uh, slide of Pope. Um, he came up with some really cool looking things that weren't practical and they don't even look like they would belong here, but he came up with some designs. I think they were more fanciful than serious um, suggestions, but he came up with pyramids, um, step pyramids, um, Mayan temple-looking things. Um, but they, but they ultimately stuck with, with um, what Bacon originally designed. And and another thing was not only what to build, but where to put it, because you know it could be there were there are different ideas of where to put it in D.C. Do we put it in a very busy area where everybody can see it? which was one way of looking at it. Another way was, you know, if you put something where people are walking by it all the time, nobody notices it. If you put it a little bit off center, away from where it's busy, and they have to make a special trip, um, it's, it's going to be more special. And so it, it ultimately ended up going, you know, where it's located at the west end of the mall, the National Mall, which, by the way, a few decades earlier had been underwater. It was before the dredging of the late 1800s. And so, so, you know, if you think about when they first started talking about the Memorial in 1867, if they would have said, we'll put it in this location, that location it would have been underwater. And um, so a lot of things changed um, over time, of, you know, for the development of the Memorial. All right. All right. That's, that's an interesting, that's an interesting fact. Uh, one of the thing that's, one of the things that struck me about the first design, the mill, that looked like what you would see in most European cities, like in Rome and, and Paris and 
um, Vienna, big memorials, you know, white uh, to the leaders of the country. Um, the the other thing that that struck me or is fascinated with is you talk about the statue of Grant points directly at the Lincoln Memorial. Is, is there any background or anything you want to add that you can add to the viewers about that? What why oh. that is? Well, absolutely, and it's a continuation of this theme that the that the line from the Capitol to the Lincoln Memorial honors the founders and the saviors of the Republic and is the anchor line, if you will, to the mall being a celebration of the reunification of the country and the people who made that possible. The Grant uh, Memorial is, is the least famous of the memorials along this line. It's at the foot of Capitol Hill uh directly below where the new president is inaugurated every four years on the west side of the capitol and uh it faces the lincoln statue two miles away and the point of that positioning is that this is the commander-in-chief and his victorious general looking at each other for all time and celebrating uh, their their great victory. That's a pretty powerful statement when you, you explain it like that. And I'm not sure how many people have grasped that or understand that. Uh, I didn't until it caught, it caught my attention in the book. So uh, let's talk about the memorial itself. Um, the design unique features. I know it's got scripting all over the place on it, the mistakes, uh, some of which I think were correct and some may not have been. Who wants, who wants to take that one? Kevin? Well, I think um, I, I'd like to talk about that, but before then, there's something else that's kind of interesting okay. um, that Brian can maybe touch on is is um, the, other, the other area around the memorial. We think about the memorial, but it, to put it in context with everything around it, including some features that were there for a long time that were downright hideous. Uh, and oh, are you talking about the family. tempos, Kevin? Yes, right. The tempos, the temporary yeah. buildings? I can right. talk about the temporary buildings. <laughs> and I think we got a picture of that here. Yeah. Uh, Grace, you want to put up the temporary buildings? While I talk about Pierre L'Enfant's and the Macmillan Commission's grand design to create this bucolic park along a fountain with these European influenced memorials with the columns and the this and the that. Even before the Lincoln Memorial was finished during World War I, the War Department decided that they needed some concrete buildings to be placed somewhere to house the War Department staff who were managing World War I. And so they threw two or three of these concrete buildings up on the north side of the tidal basin and called them tempos. <laughs> well, they stayed after the end of World War I and through the 1920s and the 1930s, and then along came World War II. And the Pentagon wasn't built yet, and this was a war that required many, many more employees of the War Departments. And so they added to these concrete buildings, and eventually they had concrete buildings stretching for almost a mile along the north side of the tidal basin and then the south side of the tidal basin. And there were so many people working in these buildings going back and forth that they eventually built bridges across the tidal basin. And it wasn't until 1970, in the 1970s, that President Nixon decided to get rid of these tempos. And so here we are, 100 years after the Lincoln Memorial was built, culminating the Macmillan plan. And you sit back and you do your math, half of that time, that plan has been destroyed by the presence of these god-awful concrete buildings. Wow. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. So and and as um, so then as we move on, um, what are some of the unique features with the memorial itself? Well, there's you know there's you know when you look at it, of course there's the columns and and the 
be a reflecting pool in front of it, the stairs. It, I mean, it's got a feeling as you're rising to look into it, you really feel like you're going into some place special. Um, so there's the overall structure, but there's some there's some interesting individual things that I think um, some people may or may not know. Um, one, you know, I'm a little bit close to because it, it has to do with Ohio, if we can have that picture. Um, Ohio, for those who are from Ohio, somewhere along the way, we, we remember that Ohio was admitted to the union in 1803. And so there are, there are two levels, two freezes that include the states. One level has the states that were in the union when Lincoln um, was president, and the upper one shows the states that were in the union when the memorial was finished. Um, and so in both of them, Ohio is listed, and the year is 1802. Well, as it turns out, um, Congress in 1802 had, had given Ohio the right to, to organize into a state, but Ohio didn't actually do it till 1803. But for years, there was debate on when did Ohio actually enter the Union, 1802 or 1803. And when the memorial was finished in 1922, at that time, there was still this confusion. So in the memorial, it was put as 1802. Well, in 1953, um, Congress finally officially said, okay, we're gonna designate 1803 is the official year that it came in. Um, so by that standard, um, these years are wrong. I don't think anybody's going to go back and chisel in an extra numeral there. Um, so that's one of the interesting things that is, is off by a year. Um, another thing that's, that's kind of interesting, if we can have the misspelling slide, is on the north wall in the north chamber. So as you walk in, it's to the right. Um, there's um, Lincoln's second inaugural address. And if you read down closely, and if you can see it in here, there's the word future. And if you look closely, that was actually chiseled as an E. Um, and they fixed it by kind of covering it up. And you can't see the black as well. But if you're standing in front of it, you can clearly see that that mistake that they um, cleared up. I think a, another thing that's kind of interesting are the columns. And um, when you look at the columns, again, it, based on the Parthenon in Greece, um, but if you if you count the columns, the exterior columns there are 36, and that's the number of states that were in the union when Lincoln, um, you know, when Lincoln was president. Um, so I think that's a an interesting thing. There's a lot of symbolism within within the memorial. Um, there's and as we talked about, there's a lot of unification, and and you know, with these these columns, the idea, you know, if you lost. Um, several of these columns, which kind of represent the states, it's not as stable as if they're all working together. Um, one of my favorite things, quirky things, I guess, with the memorial is something that most people don't see. In fact, we haven't seen it. Um, but underneath, underneath is called the Undercroft. So you have, you know, you go up the stairs and there's the statue, and then you can go downstairs and there where the restrooms are, and there's a display. But beneath that, there's, it's sort of like a big basement. Um, and it's really interesting if we can have the stalactite slide because <laughs> the floor of the memorial is marble, which is calcium carbonate like you would find in a cave. And so through the years, water has seeped through that calcium carbonate and created stalactites hanging from the ceiling of the undercroft. Um, so that's a, that just doesn't seem right to have those in a building of any kind. <laughs> no, it doesn't. <laughs> Those are unusual. Um, and there's there's one more thing I thought I would mention. Um, of course, one of the most famous scenes, I guess, at the Lincoln Memorial is the 1963 March on Washington and Martin Luther King making a speech. And if we can have the MLK slide, I don't know. Whenever I go there, I'm amazed by how many people walk over this and don't realize it. Um, there's this inscription where, where King was standing when he made his speech. And... Um, it's it's on the upper level of the steps, but it's um, it's it, you know when you stand there and look out, and you think back to 1963. I mean, and imagine him standing there with that throng of people. Um, it really gives you goosebumps. I think to be able to stand there in the same location. Yes, I I, I think you're exactly um, right, and and that was one of the things that uh, struck me was the how the um, the uh, 
the gatherings and the rallies at the memorial changed over time. And I want you guys to talk about that in a minute. But we do have a winner uh, for the first uh, trivia question. Grace? Yes, we do have a winner. So the winner was one of our regulars, Nancy Gorski. And the answer to the question was there are plaques in the plaza that feature these two specific states. Great. And I'll, I'll give the second trivia question. Uh, so we'll see if we can uh, uh, see who's paying attention out there and get the second one right. I think this is a pretty easy one. <clears throat> so which was the first movie to feature um, the Lincoln Memorial and extended scenes? So again, what was the first movie to feature extended scenes of the Lincoln Memorial? So um, the first rally that took place was at the dedication. And I went, if you, if I don't know if you have a picture of that or not. We do actually. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's the, it's the uh, dedication uh, picture. And, and the, 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 the designers of the Lincoln Memorial did not leave documents explaining what they wanted the memorial to be used for other than people showing up and looking at the statue of Lincoln and, and the engravings of the speeches. But over time, different politicians, different organizations, and just normal people have come up with a wide array of things to do uh, at and around the Lincoln Memorial. And the first of these was the formal dedication ceremony on the Memorial Day of 19. Uh, 22, we just celebrated the centennial of that a month ago, at which eminent politicians, President then President Harding, former President Taft, who was instrumental in the design of the of the memorial, with a special guest, Robert Lincoln, the eldest son of, of President Lincoln, who in his own right went on to have a distinguished political career. He appeared, it was his last public appearance before he died four years later. And that was the formal dedication of the memorial. The speeches in that ceremony very much emphasized Lincoln's role as the reuniter of the country. And with the exception of one, black speaker who attempted to remind the country in 1922 that we still had a long way to go to achieve Lincoln's vision of civil rights for all Americans, especially black Americans. His remarks were um, de-emphasized in favor of the theme of the day as reflected in the design of the building. But after that ceremony was over, people took things into their own hands. And 40 years later, there came an event, 1939, a black opera singer named Marian Anderson was scheduled to give an Easter concert at the nearby Constitution Hall owned by the Daughters of the American Revolution. Well, this is a time of continued segregation in Washington, D.C., as elsewhere around the country. And she was informed that because she was black, she would not be allowed to sing at Constitution Hall. Through the intervention of uh, Eleanor Roosevelt and Harold Ickes, the Secretary of the Interior, which controls the National Park Service, which owns the Lincoln Memorial, the event was relocated outdoors to the front steps of the Lincoln Memorial which proved to be a watershed event in turning the memorial into a symbol of Lincoln's role as the great emancipator. Uh, this event was broadcast live on the radio. It had huge numbers of attendees. It received great publicity and it was viewed as a rebuke to segregationists. And that is what led to its becoming a forum for civil rights protests culminating in the 1963 uh, event featuring Dr. Martin Luther King. But there have been all kinds of other events, both formal and informal at the Lincoln Memorial. One of the thing that, other thing that strikes me is how presidents uh, use that setting in order to link themselves to President Lincoln. You know, every president wants to be 
analogize to Lincoln. My problems are similar to Lincoln's problems. My courage and eloquence is similar to Lincoln's. And so if you can put the Biden-Harris picture up, Every president since Jimmy Carter has found a way to incorporate the Lincoln Memorial into his inaugural ceremonies, right up to our current president who had a uh, inauguration eve event at the memorial and along the tidal basin featuring a memorial to the victims of COVID, as you can see, represented by the lights that go down the Lincoln Memorial to the Washington Monument. But then it's it's a place for celebrations of all kinds. And if you can put the come from away uh, one up, uh, one of the most recent celebrations that have occurred there, and I mentioned it in my role as a Ford's Theater trustee, on September 10th of last year, the night before the 20th anniversary of 9-11, and just as theater, Broadway shows were reopening after a year and a half of COVID shutdowns. Ford's Theater Society presented a free public performance of the soundtrack from the Broadway musical Come From Away, which addresses the humanity of a of the residents of a small Canadian town towards airplane passengers who were forced to land in Canada shortly after the terrorist attacks because their planes were not allowed into American airspace. And, uh, and this was a beautiful September evening. People brought their lawn chairs and enjoyed this great free concert. And it's, it's a, it, and I was, I was fortunate to be there and it just reminded me sitting there as my book was completed and about to go to publication, that's why the memorial exists, and that's why people love the memorial. Yes, it's uh, it's uh, quite a, a place, and it's become a spot for rallies and and protests and everything else. And um, you, you know, and if if you look at the where I was going with the with the the gatherings, it, if you look at the first rallies way back when 100 years ago and the rallies today how the attitude and the cultures and the temperament of the people that are there have kind of changed and it, it it almost it almost is a microcosm for the state and the temperament and and the cultural aspects of the country and you know i think that indicates the significance that the memorial has played as a location for important events because, you know, there have been a lot of important events, a lot of places, and there are photographs of them. But at the Lincoln Memorial, <laughs> for decades, one after another, um, a march, something for civil rights, a celebration, a concert, um, a play, uh, presidential elections, there are these iconic moments that are captured. And when you put them all together, it's like a family album where you look at how Oh, look at Susie, how her chair used to be, or her glasses are so funny. I mean, you see how culture has changed through time because we have these pictures throughout the entire, you know, 20th century and going into the 21st that because it's been a site of important events and because it's been document, photo documented, it's a really great way of looking how styles have changed. And you said attitudes also, yeah. you know, the ebbs and flows of, of, um, of, you know, how people feel about their government, about um, their place in life and a lot of other things. Yeah. And, and you know, the, the appreciation for Lincoln and the, and the memorial sometimes come across subtly. And I know in your in the book, there's a picture of uh, Nat Stadium with the introduction of the players. And in the background to that is the um, Lincoln Memorial. And for as many times as I've gone to Nat Stadium, I've never noticed it. <laughs> Brian, Brian is a regular attendee at, at Nat's games, and I'm not sure if they're still showing that, but gosh, when we were working on this last year and went to a game, and, you know, it's everywhere. You get Anywhere you go around, you see pictures of it on the buses, you know, at, the, at a baseball game. Um, yeah. and, and it reinforces just how iconic it is in – 
both Washington, D.C., but also worldwide, I think. Well, and I think it re reflects the increasing informality of, of this country. Uh, 100 years ago, the Lincoln Memorial was considered the sober memorial of the Civil War, memorial of Abraham Lincoln, and a, and a triumphalist celebration of the country's emergence as a world empire. And I know this sounds pithy, but I think over the last 100 years, as the people have taken over the definition of what that memorial is and how it will be used, it has become something more akin to America's front yard to be used for anything and everything that people might want to do there. That's an interesting analogy. It's very good. We have a winner on the second uh, question. Grace? Yes. So Nancy Gorski did get the answer correct with Mr. Smith goes to Washington, but we did have someone who came in just before her with a very, very close answer. So I think we might have to give it to Nick Paglusha. I apologize if I have butchered your last name, but Nick is watching us from YouTube. So all winners, please send me your mailing address. You can email grace at thezebrapress.com. Congratulations, Nick Paliuka. Um, the so um, what's next? Where do you take this? The either the Lincoln Memorial or your next project? Uh, any thoughts as how it evolves from here? Well, one one thing is, you know, the Lincoln the centennial of the opening of the memorial. The, the exact day was this May, like, you know, several weeks ago, but, it, you know, it's something that we continue to celebrate. Um, and so, you know, we're certainly want to do things like this, you know, these radio shows and um, build awareness about the memorial. And that's what the book is for, is to build awareness about it and celebrate this iconic part of Americana. Um, and then in terms of the future, Brian and I have sort of um, informally chatted about, you know, are there other places on the mall, for instance, that are underrepresented that, that could be highlighted in a photo book like this, for instance. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I've not necessarily wanted to just do this sort of book, but, but you know, these images of America books are really great for today's society where our attention span isn't quite as long it's a lot where we live in a more visual world and to be able to look at this, these old pictures that several years ago, they just weren't available. And now um, we, they're just a lot more available and to be able to share those and tell more stories, I think is an exciting prospect. Well, from the what's new department, I, I think I can share a scoop <laughs> about the Lincoln Memorial itself. One advantage of working on this book is that uh, we've gotten to know people who work in and around the Lincoln Memorial. And I learned recently that for many years, there have been discussion about what to do with the Undercroft and can we take some of that space and put it to a better public use. And uh, what I have heard recently is that there are plans that were interrupted by COVID, but that are now back on track uh, starting next year. The plan is to is to uh, rip out the bathrooms and the small museum that is in the basement of the museum. It's very dark, it's very cramped. Um, and to rip out the gift shop, which is next to the second inaugural address, I believe, in one of the side chambers, which is also very small and dark and cramped. Put the gift shop put an expanded gift shop into that museum bathroom space and then greatly expand that space, more bathrooms, a bigger museum, and put glass walls somewhere in that public viewing area so that people can see the stalactites and the stalagmites and, and everything that's in the basement of that building. So you may be, we all may be hearing some concrete announcements about that in the coming months. That would be great. Good ideas. Well, uh, Kevin, Brian, it's been great having you on. Thank you for sharing the insights about the Lincoln Memorial and the mall in general uh, 
with our audience and uh, uh, good luck on your next ventures. I hope it's another a, a great pictorial um, journalistic um, a view of, of whatever, whether it's the Lincoln Memorial with the, uh, you know, with the project you spoke of or something else. Never know. But thanks for coming on. It's been wonderful. Well, thanks, thanks so much, us. Ralph, to you and, and Grace. This has been a lot of fun. All right. Good show. Those were fantastic photos. I love seeing those. Yeah, they are. They always, they add a lot to the discussion. And so folks get a very good visual understanding and appreciation uh, for, for, for the memorial and the mall and, and the things that uh, Brian and Kevin had to put into their book. In two weeks, Absolutely. two weeks from today would be July 12th, I think. Um, yes. Bill Winslow, former um, venture capitalist, lawyer turned novelist, has written a book called... Um, um, silver, um, um, gosh, I wrote it down. Shining Rock Grand. It's about investment capital and murder and mayhem. So it'll be an interesting, interesting story. Yeah, so, fascinating. Lawyer, lawyer turned novelist. Absolutely. Oh, that's an exciting one. Um, until we get there, we have one more episode of ZTV this week. It is Carrie in the Kitchen. Our new cooking show has and continued. So that will be an exciting episode. Um, Ralph, it was great to see you tonight. I am looking forward to this new former lawyer mystery crime novel in two weeks. Everyone, until we get there, be the good news in someone's life. That's a wrap.